Good morning. Good morning. Well, this morning we continue our sermon series on curious questions. How are the dead raised? How many of you have ever wondered that? We need more curious people in our congregation. <laughs> polite or are you asleep? Really, nobody, 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 uh, okay. <laughs> All right, when I ask a question, it's not necessarily a rhetorical question. I am, I am a curious person. That's why I'm preaching this, this series of curious questions. It's hard to learn something if you're not curious. Somebody has to take a hammer and beat your head open a little bit and pour something in. All right, don't make me do that. How are the dead raised? Well, let's take a quiz. Christianity is all about, true or false, you don't have to answer this out loud because some of you might get it wrong and that would be embarrassing, right? Okay, how many of you believe, true or false, that Christianity is all about politics? I would say a lot of you think that's true because I see it on Facebook every day. How many of you think Christianity is all about a philosophy? Okay. How many of you think Christianity is all about spirituality? That one's a little harder. How about Christianity is all about a set of rules? My sister is very brave. And she was right. All of those. Okay. So how did you do? Let's, let's grade your quiz. How many of you said all false? You can all raise your hands because I don't know. <laughs> A plus. Those are all those are not true. So what is Christianity all about? What what is it all about? Well, we've sung some good songs about it this morning, I think, Chuck, for for choosing good songs with good theology, good solid theology. There's that preacher word again. To bring us into the worship of song and bring our hearts captive to God's presence in the words and the music that our worship team has provided for us and thank you very much. Well, if you had to answer one phrase of what Christianity is all about, what would you say? Christ. Well, yes. This is true. Love. Okay. Well, we're going to visit a chapter. I mean, it's hard. It's hard to put it in one phrase. We're going to visit a chapter this morning in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that has a lot to say. Now, Paul had a lot to say about a lot of things. And I'm really glad. I've told people frequently that if Paul hadn't been imprisoned for so many times or so long, we might not have half of the New Testament. So that's a very strange thing to be thankful for, but it's a blessing to us that Paul had to actually sit down and spend some quiet time in prison or we wouldn't have a lot of, of what we have to read. Anyway, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, you will find that on page 815 in the Red Pew Bibles. I would like for you to bring your Bibles with you and if you don't, use the ones in front of you in the rack. I hope some of them are still there. Anyway, page 815, let us rise for the reading of God's Word. I'm going to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 35 through 58 selected verses. I'm going to leave out just a few of them, so if you're reading along with me, don't get afraid. Just kind of catch up, okay? But someone will say, how are the dead raised? What kind of body will they have when they come back? Look, fool, when you put a seed into the ground, it doesn't come back to life unless it dies. When you put it in the ground, it doesn't have the shape that it will have, but it's a bare green of wheat or some other seed. All flesh is not alike. Humans have one kind of flesh, animals have another kind of flesh, birds have another kind of flesh, and fish have another kind. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies. The heavenly bodies have one kind of glory, and the earthly bodies have another kind of glory. It's the same with the resurrection of the dead. A rotting body is put into the ground, but what is raised won't ever decay. It's degraded when it's put into the ground, but it's raised in glory. It's weak when it's put into the ground, but it's raised in power. It's a physical body when it's put into the ground, but it's raised as a spiritual body. If there's a physical body, there's also a spiritual body. 
But the physical body comes first, not the spiritual one. The spiritual body comes afterward. The nature of the person made of dust is shared by people who are made of dust, and the nature of the heavenly person is shared by heavenly people. We will look like the heavenly person in the same way as we have looked like the person made from dust. In an instant, in the blink of an eye, at the final trumpet, the dead will be raised with bodies that won't decay and we will be changed. It's necessary for this rotting body to be clothed with what cannot decay and for the body that is dying to be clothed in what cannot die. And when the rotting body has been clothed in what cannot decay and the dying body has been clothed in what cannot die, then this statement in scripture will happen. Death has been swallowed up by victory. Where is your victory, death? Where is your sting, death? May God add his blessing to this reading of his word. You may be seated. Now, reading this passage in the Common English Bible, which is the translation that I used, it paints some vivid word pictures that are not very nice. Rotting, decay, rotting flesh. It reminds me of when I was younger on my uncle's ranch. My cousin and I were going on some kind of grand adventure, and he said to me, hey, Denise, look at this, and I didn't ever want to miss out on anything that Scotty, he was like a year and a half older than I was, so he was, you know, if I had idol worship, it would be for my cousin Scotty. And so I said, oh, okay, what, what? And he, he took me alongside a fence, and this is a picture of the ranch. I've spoken of the ranch before. This is what it looks like in the high desert of Wyoming. There's my Uncle Paul. Anyway, he, he took me to where this, um, I wasn't quite sure what it was. I think it used to be a lamb. And he lifted up the hind leg and he showed me something of the life cycle of a ranch. The life cycle of things that crawl on the ground and, you know. Okay, yeah, I don't want to get too graphic, but... Something that used to be alive was no longer alive, and something that used to be dead was now alive in that thing that used to know. Okay, flies and maggots. That's just, all right. It wasn't a pretty picture. It wasn't God's plan either, God's original plan for that type of life cycle. And I think I had nightmares for a long time after that, which was probably my cousin's whole purpose in showing it to me. Yes. Yeah, being an older boy. Paul used these word pictures, rotting flesh and decay, to explain to us a mystery. And whenever Paul uses the word mystery, what he means is not some kind of whodunit, an Agatha Christie or a mystery novel. What Paul means by mystery is something that can only be explained by revelation. That means only God can show you what this mystery means. And so Paul goes on his way very carefully to explain this mystery to us. God must make it plain. And Paul uses illustrations from nature. And in verses 36 through 38 in chapter 15, Paul talks about planting grain. Now, the seed must die before it can grow. Now, you see the picture of the wheat there? If you've ever been on a ranch or a farm, you know that you kind of take the top part and you, and you rub it in your hands like this and then you blow and the chaff will blow away. That's called threshing and that's not an effective way to thresh wheat, but that's how you do it if you're doing it by hand. And the thing that's left, the heavy part, is the seed and it's just this dried up little hard thing It doesn't look anything like food and yet it can turn into food. So Paul uses this illustration speaking to a people that were partly agricultural so they would understand what was happening here. And the seed has to die or to rot before it can grow. Have you ever wondered why you have to water rice seed? Ask Brian Cox. Water rice seed, like overwater it when you're trying to grow the grass? It's so the hull, the outer part can rot so the seed can sprout. It has to happen. It has to die before something can grow out of it. And what actually grows, this doesn't look anything like what you planted. Not a bit. And Jesus used illustrations about the mustard seed. Remember the, the mustard seed thing? It's like this little teeny tiny, like a sesame seed. 
if you've ever had a sesame seed bun okay something like that grows into a big tree the tree doesn't look anything like the seed this is what Paul is saying the seed is nothing like what grows from it dead looking dried up tiny seed grows into this big plant this vital green living thing okay wheat is green before it turns yellow you just need to know that in case you've never seen that okay if you're a city person all right, now in verse 38 and 39, Paul talks about the differences between living beings. And he uses the, word, the Greek word sarx. That means flesh. So all flesh, all sarx is not the same. And we have here some examples of flesh that looks different. And how do we know they're different? They look different to me. They behave differently. They act differently. They probably taste different, not tasting them. Just saying, they're di the material from which they're made is not the same for these things, right? Paul argues in creation, God is not limited to just one kind of flesh not limited. Some of those things have a lot of hair. Some of them have none hair. <laughs> I didn't say that. Some of them have feathers. Some of them just have skin. Right? Some of them are leaves. So they're all different. God is not limited. God is very creative God. Lots of different types of living things. So if God is not limited to just one type of living being in creation, why would God limit God's self to living now and living then in the resurrection? Okay. In verses 40 to 41... Paul argues about glory. Now, the Greek word for glory is doxa. That means, you know when we sing the doxology? We're singing to the glory of God. Did you know that? That's what that means. Singing and speaking to the glory. So, Paul talks about different kinds of glory. There's a type of glory for living things and a type of glory for heavenly things and a type of glory for earthly things. Okay, the heavenly things, those are easy, right? The stars, we don't get to see them very much in the city unless we go outside the city. We can occasionally see some super bright ones and I usually have to read the newspaper to find out when to go outside and look for them because, you know, I think they're all airplanes now when I look up in the sky and see those bright things. But there's a type of glory in the heavens. And it, when you're out in the country, you forget and you go up, ah, oh, it just kind of takes your breath away. And there's a type of glory in the earthly things. If you've ever been to the Sequoia National Forest and seen those trees, or just laid on your, on your tummy in the grass and looked at moss, isn't it amazing the similarities between something that you can only see with a magnifying glass and something that you have to take 50 steps back to see? There's a type of glory between all of those things. And Paul says, God is not limited to any type of creation. So why would he be limited in his creative work between what we see now and what we can't see now? Bear with me. These are Paul's arguments. I want you to think about them. Next, Paul states four things about resurrected body. One, in verse 42, it is sown in corruption and raised in incorruption, or the common English Bible version, it is a rotting body is put into the ground, but what is raised will not ever decay. All right, this is the first thing Paul says. The Greek word flora usually refers to the natural condition of creation. In this verse, corruption is re referring to the natural body, the effects of the withdrawal of life. And we've all seen that, and that's what my cousin was showing me with that that farm animal that used to be alive. And so this, Paul is saying, this is the condition of life. We're alive and then we're not. What is sown in corruption is raised in incorruption. So this corrupt body, and by corrupt I don't mean immoral. What I mean is 
It's designed to not last forever, right? We want to pretend that's not true. I mean, we, we prolong it as long as we can and as well as we can. But as my husband says that he just postpones. I don't mean, that sounds negative, and I don't mean it to sound, it could, being a physician, he says he doesn't, he can't cure or heal anybody, but he postpones the inevitable. <laughs> because, you know, it's one out of one for us people. And that's what Paul is saying here. And then he says, our bodies that are sown in dishonor are raised in glory. Or, a body is degraded when it's put into the ground, but it's raised in glory. Now this dishonor or degradation describes all the miseries, the humiliations, the difficulties that we can suffer while we're here on earth. Disease, disability, aging. The resurrection body will enjoy a perfect environment like that big, big house Pastor Andy was talking about with the kids. If you don't know that song, ask them to sing it for you. Without any of the things that constantly threaten us or are, threaten our earthly existence. This is the glory to which our body will be raised. I think that sounds like good news. The third thing that Paul said about our bodies is they're weak when they're put into the ground but raised in power. And this is in verse 43 in chapter 15. From the moment we're born, our bodies are subject to weakness. Things can go wrong. Things frequently do go wrong, no matter what kind of care we take with these bodies we get. And when death comes, the body is the ultimate symbol of weakness. The resurrection body will be exempt from all that. I was um, on Facebook this morning, and Megan talked about Facebook this morning, social media in our, in our Sunday school lesson, and Mary McCormick posted something, this video called Catching Kayla. I have to tell you, I just sat there and cried. It's about 13 minutes long, but it is just the most powerful message of what we're talking about here this morning. There's this healthy young woman. She was about 14 when she first was, well, she was playing soccer, and she, loved, she was quite an athlete, and she decided to go out for track, and she's running, and her legs start tingling, and she didn't know what was wrong with her, and she was diagnosed with MS, uh, multiple sclerosis, at the age of 14, and she decided she wanted to switch from soccer to track, because soccer was a contact sport, and I mean, if I'd been diagnosed with MS, I probably would not have had the guts to continue something like that, but... Fast forward, the video is about 13 minutes, it's worth watching. Catching Kayla, K-A-Y-L-A, on YouTube. But the powerful message of this true story of this true little girl was the fact that she didn't give up. She kept running, doing the best she could. This could be an example for Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, run the race set before you. Anyway, she ran and ran and ran and ran. And one of the symptoms of or side effects of MS is when your body heats up, the symptoms of MS become much more pronounced. So as she's running, of course, she gets hot. If you've ever exercised, you know that's true. So when she's running, she learned how to run without being able to feel her legs or her feet. I can't imagine that. But here's the thing. Running as hard as she can, she has to have her coach catch her because she can't stop. She can't feel her feet or legs. Is that the most powerful image you can imagine for God? In the video, her coach is giving her instruction. He's screaming at her, hollering at her, specific things. Do this, Kayla. Do that, Kayla. You can do it. Go, go, go. Here, run that way. And, and then she, in her senior year, the last race for the championship, the interviewer said, what happened? She said, I fell. If you can't feel your feet or your legs, how do you get back up again? She did. She won the race. And they showed a video of her coach catching her. And she's panic-stricken because she can't feel her body. And she's saying, help me, help me, help me, help me. I need help. Because they have to cool her down as fast as possible. And he, he scoops her up and carries her off the course. 
She won the race. Her coach caught her. Isn't that like God? Our bodies are imperfect and we use them the best we can. We do what's possible. Sometimes what doesn't even seem possible. And God's there coaching us. He's yelling at us. You can do it. I know. He has the best advice possible. And at the end of the race, he's there and he scoops us up and carries us off and gives us our, our reward. Yeah. Praise God. I was at a funeral just a few months ago, and um, it was a funeral for our son's, our older son's best friend's grandma. And so Christopher was there with us, and he's this big, strong young man, and he just broke down and was weeping during the, the service. He says, it's not supposed to be like this. It's not supposed to be like, and it's not. Breaking down bodies and disease was not God's plan. It was not. He had something better for us. The good news is, he still has something better for us. <coughs> He's still there at the sidelines saying, go, you can do it, I'm here. He'll pick us up. And the fourth thing that Paul says about bodies is, it's sown a natural body, and it will be raised a spiritual body. Now, what Paul means by this is not, if you watch TV, spirituality is this big thing, and spirituality is not necessarily Christian. I'm just going to say it. Be careful when you're listening. Be discerning. What Paul means by it's a physical body, and this is in verse 44, versus a spiritual body. A physical body is animated by food and sleep and light and energy. A physical body is animated by the Holy Spirit, by God. God's power. So, this physical body that we have now is animated by the powers that God has put into practice here on earth. Our physical, bod our, our physical bodies will die, and then we will be raised in spiritual bodies. Those bodies will be animated by the power of the resurrection. Totally different. Not talking ghosts. I don't want you to go home and say, Pastor Denise said, we're going to be ghosts, because I did not say that. I want you to understand very clearly the difference, okay? So, Paul has shown that the resurrection of the body is an essential part, and is necessary part of God's redemption plan. The transformation of the earthly into the heavenly, of the physical into the spiritual, is God's plan, God's order. But wait, there's more. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Flesh and blood is temporary. It's perishable. And flesh and blood is what we are. It's a common way of referring to the world, to this life. So, this change from flesh and blood into our resurrected bodies is not a renovation, not a redo, it's not a set of improvements. When my, um, my second daughter, who will be 39 tomorrow, happy birthday, Jana. When she was two, I picked her up from preschool one day and we had no radio in the car, so we did a lot of talking, chatting time. And she was a very cheery, chirpy little person, very high voice. Imagine Minnie Mouse speaking in the back seat. And she said, Mommy, guess what? And I said, what? What did you learn today? And she says, when we get to heaven, and I'm waiting for some really cool theological truth, when we get to heaven, we're going to have new bottoms. And I went, is that right? That is good news indeed. 
Yes, indeedy. So, but she's right and knew everything else. <laughs> everything else, right? Okay. So, our new bodies will not be renos or improvements, they will be new. Remember, flesh and blood to spirit, they will be incorruptible. Don't ask me what we're going to be doing in heaven all those years. I don't know. It's going to be good. John Wesley was persuaded that his horse would be in heaven with him, so maybe we'll have our pets with us too. I don't know. But I'm willing to wait and find out. So, let's revisit the examples that Paul used to illustrate his arguments in verses 36 through 41 of chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians. I want you to bring your Bibles and look these up with me. Test me. Hold me accountable. Say, I didn't see that if I say something. Please. Scripture is so important to be familiar with. Okay, Paul discusses planting grain, the differences between living beings, the differences between heavenly beings and earthly beings. And Paul is drawing a powerful, compelling parallel between God's original creation and God's redemptive story. So in verse 49 we read, we will look like the heavenly person in the same way as we have looked like the person made from dust. We all resemble. You can go anywhere around the world and recognize the difference between a human being and a cotton plant. Or a human being and a platypus. We all kind of look like each other, right? Most of the same body parts. Right? So, in that way, we all look like the first people on earth, the way God created us. We all resemble each other. In that same way, we will all resemble the heavenly being when we get to heaven. Just as we are, we're all created in the image of Adam and Eve, we will all be created in God's image, imago dei. That's God's plan. God's working plan still in the image of God. At resur as resurrection defeats death, sin is defeated also. And Paul quotes some powerful scriptures there at the end of this passage we just read. The sting of death is sin. Sin is the sting for death. Victory over sin is so interwoven with the resurrection story that to deny one is to deny the other part. So if there is no resurrection, there is no possibility of victory over sin. If there is no resurrection, there's no possibility of victory over sin. Paul says that over and over and over again in that chapter. He repeats himself a lot. Why does he repeat himself? Why do I repeat myself? So we hear it. If we say something once, okay. If I say it twice, oh, she said it again. If you say it three times, Wow, okay, I'll try to remember that. Paul says it over and over and over in this chapter. If there's no resurrection, then what's it all for? He uses those words, then it's hopeless. But then he flips it around, but there is. We believe that we are redeemed people because Jesus Christ paid the price for us on the cross. Do we not? Right. Let's take that a step further. We believe that God is God because he showed us that death is not the answer. Death is not the final thing. The redemption story gives meaning to who we are. Are you not excited yet? If Jesus didn't die, there couldn't be a resurrection. He died for our sins, yes, but if he didn't come back and prove that God is power over death, then what difference does it make? I think you all need to get excited this morning. We are resurrection people. We believe in the hope of the resurrection. These corruptible bodies, these things that uh, if you run too fast and too hard and hit a curb, you break your ankle, these things are going to be replaced. 
say something a little bit better, completely different. That was an understatement, okay? Hyperbole, talked about that. Okay, Paul was writing to a church that was struggling with terrible issues, and it was battling for its life against enormous odds. If you read the rest of the two long letters to Corinthians, you realize that they had some serious problems in that church. So he was laying out for them right here and right now who they were, why they have hope, what their plan is, what God's plan is for them. God has beaten death so he can deal with this other stuff. Give him hope. So several things stand out in Paul's reminder here. First, where's the power come from? God was doing it all. God had the power. God raised Jesus from the dead. The resurrection was something that God did. It was very clear to Paul, and he wanted it to be clear to us, that the resurrection was a great example of God working in this world. Because this world is corrupt. And by corrupt, I don't mean immoral. By corrupt, I mean it's fallen apart. Everything ages. Right? Even trees. We had citrus trees that just kind of... Uh, and I asked the tree guy, he says, oh, well, they only live about 40 years. I said, really? Everything in this world has an age limit. This is a corrupt world. It's not a permanent world. We're just a passing through, if you want to sing that song. Okay? God is acting in this world. God is active in this world. God has a plan. He's active in the routines and the events right here. He's not some far-off ruler of the universe, disinterested. Okay, I wound up the clock. I'm going to let it run now. No. God's here and now. He's working with us. He's listening. He's speaking. He's, he cares. He wants to be involved. The same God who raised Jesus from the dead surrounds your life with loving kindness. The God you worship and serve is here. The same God. Suddenly, the resurrection moves from that spectacular area of wow to you and me. It's personal. It's personal. We have to look at the resurrection and decide what to do about it. If you read the first part of chapter 15, Paul lays out a, a, a timeline. He said, all right, when Jesus was resurrected from the dead, these people saw him, then these people saw him, and then these people saw and then I, the least of all the apostles, and then he showed himself to 500 people and then to James. You know, you'll have to ask Paul why he listed it that way. But God did it. People saw it. And then they had to decide, do I believe that? If I believe that, then what am I going to do with it? It's not some philosophy. It's this, wait, wait, I know his family. I know the people who saw him. So, you have a decision to make. When you come face to face with the resurrection power of God, what do you do with it? This is personal. It comes down to each person. So, do we stow it away as a, some kind of dusty piece of information? And, oh, yeah, I read my Bible. I read that chapter. I read that whole book, 1 Corinthians. Yeah, wow, they had a lot of trouble. They were messed up. But what do you do with the reality of the resurrection power? The God that defeated death. We're not talking just immortality here. That's a part of it. We're talking God changed everything. He broke it and remade it completely over. And we are a part of that. So what do we do with it? It's not a philosophy. It's not a set of rules. It's not a spiritual practice. It's not, you know, that quiz we took at the very beginning. It is 
a God who broke death. And that's our God. And that's our God. So how are the dead raised? By the power of God, who broke. If Jesus didn't die, God couldn't have showed us in that way how death is broken. So the last two verses in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we read, Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God who gives us this victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. As a result of all this, my brothers and sisters, my well-loved brothers and sisters, you must stand firm, unshakable, excelling in the work of the Lord as always, because you know that your labor is not going to be for nothing in the Lord. Okay, all of that, that whole verse to prove the resurrection, and then this very, the very last verse, verse 58, he says, and, and now... And now this is what you have to do, right? And now, thanks be to God. Let's praise God. That's the doxology right there, people. Doxa, raising thanks to God, the glory of God. As a result of all this, okay, now here is our walking order. Stand firm, unshakable. Keep doing that good stuff you're doing. And that's what the missionary lesson was about this morning. How to be missionaries wherever we are. Whether you work at the zoo, or whether you are a clerk at Walmart, or whether you work at Intel. You know, wherever we are, God has put us there. So wherever you are, that's your mission field. So we stand firm, unshakable, committing ourselves to the excellence of God's work. Have you ever wondered if you were actually accomplishing anything? How many of you feel like you're you know, like in one of those gerbil wheels? <laughs> just, oh my goodness. We are in good company. We just, God, am I making a difference? We don't know. What we do know is if we're obedient to where God has placed us, if we're obedient to do what God has put in front of us, how can you say that that person who's, who asks you for something isn't doing that because God said, go, talk to them. If we're listening and responding to God, then we know, we know that our labor is not meaningless. Do you want to make a difference? I do. I want to know. We might not know, but we can know. We have the assurance that God can use it. Can I hear an amen? Amen. <laughs> amen. Okay. So, what we do for God really does count. God's resurrection power has defeated death and defeated sin. And because of that, we are a people of hope. We are a resurrection people. Amen. Amen. So, be encouraged. Be lifted up. God has broken the bad stuff. And he's got good stuff. If God is for us, who can be against us? That could be your motto. It's mine. If you ever feel like you're, you know, whatever, on that side of the ledger. If God is for us, who can be against us? Amen. Prepare yourselves for your blessing, your benediction. And now, may the almighty power of the Creator God the merciful love of the compassionate Son, and the life-giving breath of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.